Sure, why not? Yeah, so maybe like looking back a little bit. So um, since the beginning of the project, the sort of decision making and the governance has been very centralized in the, in the core team uh, that's working on the project every day. And while that worked well in the beginning, it's always been the goal to eventually be uh, transferring the control of the project to a DAO or at least some kind, some form of decentralized decision making. And the current model that uses snapshot and token based voting that we're going to get into in a bit is sort of like a lightweight version, like making a full-blown governance model with like, a, I don't know, constitution and on-chain voting and like trying to get things that are enforceable on chain and this kind of things it's maybe a little bit over the top i think like the quick win there is to start with this kind of lightweight process where the token holders can uh, um, express their opinions and decide about proposals and then the core team will uh, sort of um, implement those those decisions and one particular problem um, among many, I guess, with the centralized governance model is that it's really hard to decide about hard questions, basically. So, you know, um, and as you'll see, the two first proposals are not, you know, there's no right or wrong, but they are controversial in the sense that they have pros and cons. So for me, it wouldn't make sense to kick off a governance process with some uh, trivial proposals or some obvious ones, you know, but these are actually the hard questions that are not solvable by a centralized decision-making pro uh, process. And I personally would not be comfortable making these decisions myself or within the, within the uh, project leadership. So I think they make uh, excellent first proposals for for a decentralized governance, exactly for the reason that they are in no way obvious and uh, people need to sort of weigh the, the pros and cons and, and decide like what the, what the threats and opportunities attached to each proposal uh, might be. Um, so this is how we're gonna roll forward. Um, I don't know what the cadence of these like votes will be going forward. We'll just have to like do this first round and see how it goes. And uh, maybe there will be like some window every month or whatever when uh, there might be like a vote if there are proposals. If there are no proposals, then then it will sort of roll to the next month or or whatever. So it's a learning experience for for us as well on how to do this. And obviously, we uh, wish that as many token holders as possible would participate in this vote, especially as the voting is off-chain and doesn't cost gas and so on. So it's fairly easy to, to be involved in, in this thing. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so that's the sort of reasoning behind why start a governance process in the first place. It enables us uh, as a community of token holders to decide about hard questions and it also adds a lot of utility of course to the token as as then you have sort of this opportunity to to vote on things so in the first round of voting there's two proposals the first one uh, sip one or streamer improvement proposal one is probably the bigger one and the more controversial one and uh, so i think in this ama we should spend more time on that but also not forget about SIP2. So SIP1 is about doing a token migration where the one important parameter of the token would be changed and that important parameter is the maximum um, maximum supply or the so-called hard cap which is the uh, largest amount of tokens that can ever exist. So one important thing right off the bat is that Passing this proposal does not change the amount of tokens and does not create any dilution um, on the token. But rather, the point of SIP1 is to enable the community to decide about minting tokens in the future. So it's like adding, uh, adding another tool in the toolkit and more power to the 
community. Whereas with the current token smart contract, the hard cap is sort of reached. So it is not possible to, to mint any tokens. All tokens that can ever exist in the current uh, sort of supply policy um, already exist and have existed since, since the ICO. Um, so there's, there's pros and cons and we can dive into those and uh, those in a bit. Um, but just briefly covering also a SIP2. So this is a roadmap change. So we've had this tooling in the streamer ecosystem called Canvases since the beginning. Um, and it comes also with a sort of um, side thing called dashboards. And this is a tool for doing things with, with data uh, and the streams that are on the streamer network. So uh, it's the drag and drop tool that many of you have seen in the streamer core application, allows you to in a drag and drop style, like connect your data sources with some, um, some computing primitives like calculating moving averages or, or that kind of statistical variables and then routing those results to another stream or, or some visualization widgets and that kind of things. And then dashboard uh, is a related feature where you can just create a selection of those visualization widgets over uh, all your canvases to sort of uh, make like a, you know, mixing and matching those visualizations from different canvases in, in one view. And the reasoning behind this proposal is that, um, you know, while the tool is useful to some people in the community, it's been a little bit of a side thing, um, but it does drain a bit of resources. Um, so, you know, it's a balanced act of whether we continue to maintain this tool or face the fact that maybe it's, you know, not ever going to be the best real-time analytics tool and not the best dashboarding tool out there. Um, and, we, and, you know, the proposal is to sort of discontinue it at least uh, for the time being um, in favor of sort of liberating those resources to either focus more on the core things that are perceived to be like core streamer things like the network obviously and the tokenomics uh, and perhaps some other tooling that come on top like data unions and that kind of things that have more traction than, than this tooling. And maybe also create some integrations to some popular alternatives to, to these canvases. But we've kept them around since the beginning, since they've sort of been there. But as we move further towards decentralization, it's becoming like maybe an like increasing burden to, to drag them along, or at least now would be a good time to decide whether we're gonna keep those in the long term. Um, or not. So SIP2 is like a really good temperature check for um, you know what what the talk community of token holders thinks about uh, about that. Again something that was included in the original white paper and the original roadmap so it's really hard to decide about that in a centralized fashion like you know me just saying like um, okay let's drop canvases now you know and uh, you know that's that's different from what we said in the white paper, right? So, so the first principle is that we're bound by what was said in the white paper to some extent. Of course, we've learned along the way and so on, unless the token holders decide otherwise, because the token holders are really the beneficiaries of the project. So if they decide to make changes to the original plan, then it's, it's completely fine and we can do this kind of uh, changes. And I think it would give the project agility to uh, to react to changing situations like we're not in 2017 uh, anymore so so things change and we need that capability to make even like um, even big changes mm. so yeah this overview is maybe becoming too long but but that's the overview of those two proposals I think these two are just uh, first of many um, uh, so there will probably be uh, many more going forward and at the moment how it works is that 
on Snapshot, which is the tool that we're going to use, is that only the core team can submit proposals, but there's also an opportunity to open it up for community proposals, and you can put a limit there uh, so that you have to have a certain amount of tokens to be able to submit proposals, and opening up that community proposal section could actually be the topic of uh, of a vote at some point. So the token holders can vote, like, do we uh, open up the community votes or, or just keep it at the core team or, or whatever. So it's, you know, we can decide about very many things using this, this kind of system. Um, I think I was supposed to cover also how the, how the voting works in practice. Is that, is that right, Tom? Yeah, if you, well, there's instructions from um, Matthew, a video in the blog, but maybe just very briefly. Yeah, it's quite well described in the blog. We actually found that there wasn't great material like a screencast or anything to show how you actually vote on Snapshot, which is weird because a lot of projects are using uh, Snapshot for, for this kind of thing. So no one bothered to create good materials about it. So, so we made a quick uh, screencast about it, so, so check that out. But how it basically works, uh, just the sort of uh, one, two, three of it, is that there's a particular block number, the snapshot block, which is where the name of the tool comes from. So um, at that block on Ethereum blockchain, uh, it will sort of take a snapshot of the balances of uh, each account um, in the Data, uh, data token smart contract. And that will be your voting power. So it's a bit like a photograph. It's a frozen moment in time, uh, which will determine your voting power for both of these two proposals. And later proposals will have their own you know, times when the snapshot will, will happen. And the important thing to know is that um, the smart contract will only see like where what, what Ethereum account holds those uh, tokens. So um, in order to be able to vote, you're going to have to be able to sign a, a payload with your wallet. So if you have your tokens now in an exchange or deposited into a liquidity pool, for example, on Uniswap or whatever, uh, you're going to have to withdraw them briefly um, into your wallets for which you, you control the private key. So I don't know, maybe you have your ledger, you have your MetaMask, you have whatever wallet you use, you're going to have to have the tokens in there on the snapshot block. And once the block is over, the photograph is taken, you know, you can then again move your tokens wherever uh, you want. And you will have that, that voting power that comes with it. Uh, I heard you breathing there. Do you have a question? No, that's. I think that's great. And, yeah. we've, uh... <laughs> and, and then on Snapshot, you go there, you click on the proposal. Um, then there's basically two decision buttons, uh, accept or reject. You click on that, you sign it with your wallet and you're done. So it's like super, super easy if you've gotten, if you've gotten far enough to have those tokens in your wallet at the time of the snapshot. So everything from that point onwards is like super easy. And the snapshot block number is in the blog post. Uh, I don't remember it by heart, but it's um, estimated to uh, occur uh, around noon UTC on, on Thursday. Um, so that's when you need to have those tokens in your wallet. And that's about it. Uh, of uh, regarding the practicalities of the vote. It should be quite easy. Great. So let's go to some of the questions. Um, we tried to summarize them into uh, recurring themes. If we think, if you think we've missed anything, um, we have any follow-ups, then the discussion section is the time to, to go back over that. So maybe to start with Henry, um, Maybe you can give some examples of incentive games that can be enabled by a token migration, as an SP1. Yeah, maybe to give a little bit of, of background. So, so before answering that <laughs> that fully. Sure. So, like I said, um, SIP1 won't 
mint any new tokens. It just enables further governance proposals to decide about minting new tokens. And why, why on earth would the community decide to mint new tokens, right? So, so what, um, what can be gained by, by doing so? And one particular thing that um, I think the community should, uh, should consider and, and vote about in the future is like creating these pools of, of incentives. So it's very common in many different blockchain systems that you have this um, like unrealized supply in the sense that you have a potential to, to create new tokens. Um, there can be a hard cap uh, or it can be sort of, it can be also like a, you know, infinite supply, but those are not very popular because there's like unbounded amount of tokens that can exist. So I think what this proposal establishes is that there's a, there's a fixed limit uh, and it's set fairly high actually and we can talk about that later. Um, that just enables like um, you know space to decide about token programs without uh, without having like uh, you know infinite or, or unreasonable supply. So for example mm, some projects have like similarly shaped. For example, um, one project that we were following closely uh, a while back because they did a similar thing was the Ocean Protocol. And whereas they had sort of decided the size of the mm, pool, I'm a bit hesitant to call it pool because it doesn't, you know, those tokens don't exist in the beginning, but a reservation of tokens uh, that equaled like half of the, the hard cap. Um, and they, they made a similar token um, migration to sort of get to the hard cap that they originally planned. And, and so the, you know, half of the tokens were existing from before and then half of the token belonged to this uh, incentive supply. Um, and if you think about Bitcoin, for example, where the core value promise is that there will never, never be more than you know, 21 million Bitcoins or whatever, and there they have a growing supply as well. So the hard cap is decided and, and set and part of the core promise of Bitcoin, but the supply is growing at every block and, um, and new tokens are being minted and, and given to the miners as incentives to, to participate. So this kind of inflationary reward programs are very common, they exist everywhere and they have proven to be like super useful tools to incentivize people to participate. So now, in go now going to your question, like what examples of incentive games uh, are enabled? Uh, I think one core thing that the project should try to establish and incentivize is once we reach the milestones of the network, the next milestone Brubeck and especially the next one uh, called Tatum which is scheduled for next year, it will be very important for people to sort of activate and start running these uh, streamer nodes and participate in running the network. So in the beginning mm, the fees will be low. So if you think of the earnings, like, mm, how should I say it? So people running nodes should be able to earn tokens. Otherwise they might not run those nodes, uh, at least in the big picture of things. I know that many enthusiasts will, but if you look at it from the big picture, there needs to be a reward. Um, and in the beginning, the fees in the token economics will be quite, low, right? Because the, the system needs sort of bootstrapping or, or like getting, um, getting started, you know, it needs to be jump started with a couple of, of cables, <laughs> you know, like zzz, and then it, then it starts. So this kind of um, reward programs can be really useful in doing that, that kind of bootstrapping so that you can have uh, a pool of tokens that get distributed to the early adopters of of the streamer node and those who participate in running the network and they get rewarded in this way while the fees from actual usage of the network build up over time as the network gets traction. So what we're talking about really is like solving the chicken and egg problem in the sense that uh, in the beginning the network doesn't have a lot of uh, mm, 
supply uh, and and there's also not a lot of demand so and these are connected uh, so if there's too much supply like too many people running nodes but no uh, no demand and um, in other words like people who want to use the network the supply side is not earning anything and on, on the other hand if there's a lot of demand but no supply then the network will be overwhelmed and can't sort of perform its task of, of distributing those those data points so these go hand in hand but it's hard for one to exist without the other so what typically happens then is that you have these bootstrapping uh, schemes where you can reward the supply side um, and build that up while um, while the demand side will follow and it's quite similar in for example many DeFi pools and you know yield farming has been the hot topic of, of 2020 and it works exactly the same so these services like, um, like you know your Uniswap, Curve, Balancer, uh, Harvest, so on all of these have had very similar token incentive programs that reward certain kind of behavior and it's important especially in the beginning usually the rewards sort of you know uh, go down over time when uh, at the same time the organic rewards or the fees from volume in in DeFi case or liquidity providing case and in streamer case the fees from um, from the data traffic go up over time so I think this would be like one of the very 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 core reasons to have this weapon in our in in the arsenal of of the community uh, to be dis able to decide about that kind of programs to be launched in the future sounds good um maybe it's been really, um moving on to um whether the team has already any plans uh for the sort of next stages of SP3, SP4, um, if these pass? Yeah, no, no plans. Um, I think, like I mentioned already, one proposal that, that I have in mind is like opening those community proposals. The question there is where to set the, the level uh, or the threshold, like who is able to propose. If it's set too low, then there will be a lot of junk. You can easily see it by going to some of the snapshot spaces of, of other projects there's a lot of uh, just some junk proposals that are not very serious uh, in that sense uh, but if you set it too high then the number of people who can actually contribute proposals is is going to be quite low so finding the balance there another topic that could be a future proposal uh, idea is like maybe the next step of, of data unions so we're on the verge of being able to launch the sort of second generation uh, architecture of data unions so that's quite close now and then the question becomes okay like then what you know what are we gonna which direction are we gonna drive data unions to as a as a next step and there are some ideas about that but um, you know they could be run through the governance process as well and there's for the sort of thing that many people are concerned about is like minting those tokens there's no plan to to introduce that kind of proposals in the near future uh, and anyway if if we and by we i don't mean us as a team but we as collectively like you guys as well um, if we decide to do that in the future then then um, those, will, those will go into the vote and only then would any tokens be uh, be minted and you know the people are concerned about inflation and so on and it's true um, it will inflate uh, by by the amount that gets minted but for me personally uh, and I've said this um, a few times is that like in a market that is volatile enough that you know the price of assets is going up and down like 10% every day it's like the the inflation that any such minting program would introduce is just so tiny compared to the overall 
noise of the market that personally I don't see that having any kind of significance uh, compared to what can be achieved by ha having these kind of programs available that you can really like make this incentive program distribute out some tokens to to early adopters have them earning like um, yields on on stakes and this kind of things it will bring streamer right into that sort of token economical game that has been such a hot topic from 2020 onwards where um, you're able to earn these yields on your tokens you're able to of course the whole point of decentralization to, to participate in running the network and earn tokens by doing so and and so on and so on so it will just be like a super interesting thing that will just like is it for me it's like on a completely different level in terms of uh, what value it can add to the ecosystem as compared to this inflation that so many people are are worried about so that's that's my take. I just wanted to put it out there on the table um, and everyone will of course form their own um, opinions but, but I see like the upside like you know <laughs> this big I don't know if you, everyone's watching my video but like this big and then the you know re inflation is like you know it's a factor of course and it shouldn't be ignored or, or downplayed but um, you know there you have it. And doubling the cap is like just uh, you know to put enough there, but actual minting proposals might be like ten percent or fifteen percent, something like this. Um, but it's better to make a big reservation for the long term, uh, long term play. I, I want this project to be alive, in, alive in you know ten, twenty years, thirty years from now. So um, it's hard to make so far-reaching decisions early on especially as the space moves so quickly so even since 2017 we've moved um, quite quite far the space has evolved so it's hard to predict what what comes so better to enable the community to make things rather than restrict the community from from taking that kind of decisions anyway i'll i'll let you shoot another question <laughs> Sure. Um, so you've covered quite a few of these. Um, um, maybe you can talk a bit about the um, the network and give some examples about uh, how these might uh, might be used to incentivize nodes on the network. Yeah. So there's two upcoming milestones, obviously. Uh, there's the Brewback that's coming this year. And there's Tatum that's coming next year. Uh, sorry, Brubeck this year, Tatum next year. And in Brubeck, we, we're not going to yet have the full token economics in the sense that uh, users of the network uh, would pay and, and that flow of tokens would go to the, to the brokers. So one use uh, for these incentive pools would be to sort of uh, enable the network to decentralize earlier on so we could have a really big brewback network with uh, with this sort of farming incentives instead of the fee in incentives that will only really come in the tatum milestone so it just enables us to you know gain size and traction and sort of notable number of nodes in the network um, earlier on and that would probably be be useful and even if the tatum milestone then introduces these uh, proper token economics and the full flow of uh, fees then having those sort of extra incentives in the beginning will still be useful like we've seen in the DeFi space so um, so if you think about like if if we vote against if we vote against this proposal then those incentives will not be available then brewback will be uh, you know brewback will be like ipfs uh, uh, where 
you can run a node, but it's non-incentivized. So you're basically doing it for either charity or your own reasons. Like uh, in the token economics group, we call it the, the um, intrinsic utility. So you have a use case, you want to use the network, that's why you're running a node. Um, so then it will be limited to that and the scope of people who will run nodes in the network will be a lot smaller if it's only based on charity or intrinsic utility. Um, but uh, yeah. That, le oh, that leads into another question about um, block science. Um, and maybe you can uh, shed some light on some of the research that's been going on there and whether this decision is a consequence of that. Yeah, well, sort of. I mean, for sure, it's recognized in the simulations that we're doing in the research track with block science that bootstrapping um, helps the network grow. And, you know, that's not rocket science. That's quite obvious by looking at any project. Uh, out there for like of course ethereum and bitcoin but uh, one example that's quite interesting and sort of close to our space even though it's completely different is helium uh, so what they're doing is this like um, decentralized um, radio network that works over over lora one um, frequencies and it's basically like a, for iot devices to get their data data upstream and you know they've managed to get I don't know 10,000 20,000 nodes out there uh, with this kind of bootstrapping program and they saw a lot a bit of backlash actually from the community because in the beginning they had like an infinite supply so they introduced a governance process they decided on a cap like okay this is the maximum that, that will there will ever be and, and then, they're, then they're doing it. So it's pretty awesome for two reasons, I think, how, how that went down. First of all, like, uh, is the bootstrapping part that they actually were able to grow the network very fast uh, into a very big um, state with these incentive programs. And secondly, they also showed that the governance can work to sort of guard the best interest of the token holders and to really change the parameterization after the fact. Like, of course, the best is to plan for everything from the beginning, um, like many projects have, have successfully done, but also times change, the blockchain space moves very fast. Uh, you have to be able to make decisions, otherwise you'll just get uh, left behind. So, so you'll have to be able to adapt to what's happening and the, the current situations and the information that you sort of learn and observe along the way. So I get it that some people might think that, you know, uh, wow, this hard cap is like a sacred thing that should never be touched. But I think that the token holders should be able to decide whatever they want, like uh, anything really. Um, as long as it's fair and, and weighted in the, in the correct way uh, so that the token holders can decide about their own, uh, you know, ec the economy that they're participating in. And, and that's the most important thing. There were a few questions that related to that about the, the weighting of voting and um, uh, the ability of the streamer team or treasury to vote. I don't know if you can discuss some of the thinking behind that and... yeah sure so the weights of voting are just linear they're just simple so you know if you have a million tokens then you have a million voting power uh, i guess um so so that's simple there there could be other models uh, some projects have experimented with quadratic voting that you get more power the more tokens you have or or like square root type of behavior that you get like diminishing returns in in power um so yeah both you know there's arguments <clears throat> both ways um but i think the sort of just direct linear um formula there is like a fair one and a sort of straightforward one it doesn't need 
sort of justification one way or, or the other, it's very easy to understand that, okay, one token, one vote, that's it. Uh, so that's, that's the weighting in the vote. The governance process can later decide to change it if they want. So this is just a starting point that we felt that, okay, this, this makes sense and is a popular choice in the ecosystem. Um, <clears throat> what I'm slightly worried about is the sort of voting, um, voting activity, like how many people uh, at the end of the day actually show up to vote. I've been sort of watching a little bit the activity of other projects in voting um, and you know if if in real world politics we have the problem that the voting activity is low in general then it is also quite low in the in the blockchain space unfortunately um, but i would like to of course encourage everyone to participate and it will be very important to sort of uh, engage engage in this but the expectation is that uh, that you know it, we're not going to have like 90% of of you know tokens represented in those votes or or anything like that um, but those who do vote on the other hand then have probably like first of all they are very interested in the projects they've researched the the proposals and you know thought about them they don't just show up to to cast some dummy votes uh, or you know random you know so I think we will get good quality votes from those who do vote and then the rest the rest we shouldn't really care about I guess since they're not since they don't care enough about the project to even show up to vote um, so so that's it um, so uh, for sure typically these kind of votes might be like sort of you know swung by by whales big token holders that that have a lot of voting power as well but on the other hand they are also the ones who have the biggest risk in in making those decisions so it sort of turns out fair i guess in that sense that those who have a big interest big stake in the project also have their have their say um, yeah, um, was there some specific questions about the uh, voting powers yeah. of the company or the team or, or something like that? I think voting powers of the company might be one to discuss, and particularly the stream of treasury. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so the company, which sort of is uh, responsible for for delivering the project, which is which is this. This company here. Uh, if you see my picture, you see our our small office here in Tug. Uh, the company holds at the moment, I think, a little bit over ten percent of of the whole supply. Mm, it's not exactly sure if the company will vote. We'll have to decide whether we actually vote with those company tokens or or not. Of course, the company does have a big interest and also does have a lot of insight into what might be best for the project so um, my default recommendation would be that uh, all token holders should definitely vote on this which also includes the company that is one of the major uh, stakeholders in the project as for the team uh, i mean i don't know it's it's not my business to to really like see how how many tokens you know my colleagues have or or whatever um, so it's it's their business some have probably sold some tokens some have bought some tokens so i'm not actively aware of what those guys are doing um, even though like on the blockchain you can see of course the top top addresses uh, the, the very top addresses tend to be like the Binance pools where you have you know a lot of tokens in the same pile and you can't really see into uh, into how that is like split inside of the centralized exchange and the, the company pool is also there in the top token holders and probably some early whales and team members and, and that kind of people like on the on the top list. 
there and then it quite nicely sort of spreads out but you know if the all together you know in in, in the ICO the company got 15% and team members in total got 15% or so even then it was only 30% uh, and that's gone down because some have sold uh, the, some of the company tokens have been spent on on some stuff uh, like reward programs or you know exchange listings something like this um, so the those shares have come down so maybe this is just a ballpark figure but if you know uh, if the company still has 10% and the team has altogether 10% then that would be 20% of everything uh, so it's it's not exactly like the company and the team call all the shots like 80% of all tokens are, are somewhere else so if the if people activate and come to vote then uh, then it's truly the sort of shared community of token holders that make the decision um, so the team doesn't have any extra weight or anything like that in this decision making and we as a team like you know i'm not telling people what to vote or anything like that so so people will make their own minds and vote uh, how they think is the best for the project for these proposals and or or all future ones okay so i'm going to jump to a couple of other specific questions um we've had and if anyone else has any comments or questions, please add them in the governor's channel and we'll open it up to more general discussion. Really good question um, so far, by the so way. So thanks, community, mm -hmm. for posting those. So one is, um, could SIP1 have a hard-coded max inflation rate instead of a max token supply? It could, uh, of course, uh, or maybe in addition um, to that. If you just have like a inflation rate, then it would mean an infinite supply, I guess, uh, which most people don't want. Um, but I think having like uh, a rate that is like decided now in advance of knowing what exactly that pool will even be used for, that would be a bit premature in, in my opinion. And that would tie the hands of the project um, for for years to come so if we think you know if we're not just thinking like this year next year if we're thinking five years ten years then you know leaving those options open for the community to at any given time decide about what they want what kind of incentive pools they want to create up to the the hard a cap that will probably never be reached but you know it's there as a safety mechanism or, or whatever um, personally I prefer that and that's why I decided on that um, in my in my proposal but is there also a plan uh, for some kind of burn mechanism um, no plan per se I mean uh, it depends a little bit on how the eventual token economics of the network will, will evolve. Uh, personally, um, like sometimes burning is used to, to you know, in my opinion, a little bit obfuscate what's what's really happening. For example, you know, someone's uh, someone's burning and someone's minting on the on the other side. That's just a payment that doesn't look like a payment and maybe there are some regulatory or legal reasons to do it like that so you know that's one sort of burn and mint mechanism that that exists not a big fan of that personally but but then there can be this like um like actual burning so so basically just reducing the supply over time for example some percentage of the fees in the network could be burned and which would reduce the supply over time and I think this kind of models are, are are quite interesting if they serve a purpose I think the value of the ecosystem is largely mm, driven by the value that it delivers and not this kind of games necessarily you know if we burn 
if we burn 5% of the fees or something, that's again like small, you know, that's, that's a small thing. It's a nice thing, but the true question is like, can we create a technology that actually gets traction and adds value to the world so people can, um, you know, create new kind of data economies, they can, they can create new kind of business models around data, uh, they can reduce their reliance on, on the big cloud infrastructures and so on and so on. So these are the big things. And then like whether we burn 5% of the fee flow, that's like a, it's like a small thing, but um, that's just my opinion. But um, certainly those are possible and very interesting. And I would love to see that kind of things proposed in the future and would probably vote for them. You mentioned it um, briefly before, but maybe it's also worth just finishing this section talking a bit about the general um, sort of market trends you see, I guess, in the Web3 uh, decentralized finance space and sort of how this uh, ties in with it timing-wise, sort of why now? Yeah, I think, you know, there's been a lot of lessons learned from, from DeFi. Um, and for me, maybe the biggest lesson learned uh, really is that, like, Mm, there's this huge power in, in being able to create these incentive programs. So obvious, like what could be what could be a more powerful weapon than to print money, right? You know, that's that's the ultimate weapon, and it's shown it's been shown in the DeFi space that it works really well in building uh, these ecosystems in the beginning. So the whole DeFi space went from zero to hero with uh, you know. Um, so, uh, some of these projects launching these uh, sort of inflationary token token rewards. So that was pretty amazing. And also the whole dialogue has changed. So now everyone's thinking like, which tokens are earning me a yield, uh, basically, so, um, so that they can be either used for staking in proof of stake blockchains or borrowing and lending on those platforms or providing liquidity on, on those um, DEXs and, and so on. Um, so this is an important question and I think it's one of the main um, sort of upsides or, or these amazing things that blockchain and decentralization enable at the end of the day that you can participate in this peer-to-peer financial games and, and uh, what the sort of network token economics can achieve especially at, at scale is that streamer becomes a part of these kind of ecosystems you know you can go you can stake your tokens on some, on some nodes and earn the rewards that those nodes are earning from the network you'll be able to earn like an APY on your on your data tokens and obviously you're going to be able to earn a yield on on your broker nodes uh, that you run and so on and so on so it will just make mm, it will make the game very interesting for for everyone and the token has been even though we're a token project and a crypto project the token has been maybe a weak spot in uh, in streamer from the point of view that you know we've first focused on building the underlying system like streamer is not a you know your everyday app project really it's like building completely new peer-to-peer -peer network and that that infrastructure so um, you can't really have these token games um, unless you have that infrastructure so you you have to do it in that order and that's why we are like three years down the road and we've been building that and the token has had like limited use sure it's been usable um, as a means of payment on the marketplace and so on and so on but really the the true intended utilities and uses for the token are in the in the data uh, in the token economics of the network and in governance and now we're sort of starting to nail the governance part uh, by launching this governance process and also of course working towards introducing the token economics uh, into the decentralized streamer network and uh, over over the course of this year and the next great 
so there was a question uh, on SP2. Um, so if canvases and dashboards are discontinued, uh, what, what are the alternatives? And would it be possible to keep the functionality of canvases but stop support? Yeah. So I mentioned a couple of alternatives in in my blog post, and it's quite interesting. Like I said, when when introducing the second proposal, like is is it even reasonable to think that the canvas tool that we build is is gonna be the best tool for for a particular thing? It's sort of like it's a broad thing that you can do many simple things with. You know, you can get your moving averages, you can get your simple oracle things that uh, you know send data to ethereum smart contracts you can build visualizations um, and, and that kind of things but is it really going to be the best tool for any any of these particular common tasks that people need to do in the streamer ecosystem or would it just be better to you know make integrations to popular tools that are being used elsewhere. And we've already started on this track way back when we had the sort of um, labs program that was creating this kind of thing. So for example, we made a streamer integration with Node-RED, which is the open source sort of similar user interface to canvases where you can drag and drop and connect these data flows in a visual interface. Um, it's, it's made by IBM uh, originally, uh, so we did that. Then we export like this Spark integration. Spark is a, like an you know, analytics um, framework that's very, very powerful and very, very used. Um, so mm, then, there's, then there's Grafana, for example, which is a popular dashboarding tool. Um, so just making an integration to Grafana might just make more sense than uh, building our own dashboard tool. <laughs> and actually someone in the, in the community, like a couple of days later, uh, made this Grafana integration and I saw a video about it and it was extremely cool. So, so this is exactly the power, you know. So why, first of all, why are, why are we trying to make the best possible tool where like, better tools already exist and are available and people are using them and we can just sort of integrate with them. And secondly, the community can really participate by enabling these integrations and contributing to them. You know, if you're, if you're working in, in software, you have a bunch of tools that you use every day, especially in, you know, DevOps and, and that kind of uh, space. So Streamer is a great message transport to for for connecting uh, data streams and real-time data metrics this kind of things to to those tools so um, just build those integrations and they will benefit everybody else and in this way we can get like way better reach for the technology than um, you know maintaining something like like canvases uh, that's the sort of reasoning we can we can do it um, and it's great it's always a cool effect like today I was in a call and I was showing the sort of streamer stuff that we build and once again the, the canvases tool are, are like invoking a reaction from the other side okay cool like this is pretty cool so it's a tough decision like it's, it's sort of mm, but you know, kill your darlings is sometimes the, the best thing you can do for, for the project. And it just adds focus to the things where, where, there's, more, where there's more potential. And the other part of the question was, like, could the functionality be retained without, uh, while still dropping support? Well, well sort of. The, the problem is that the network uh, so obviously the canvases tool uses the network uh, underneath, like like everything in the streamer ecosystem, they they use the network. So as the network evolves uh, towards the decentralized milestones, Brubeck and and Tatum, there 
there are changes to be made and the canvas tool was sort of originally created uh, in the in the first milestone where we still had this centralized infrastructure so it will be a fair amount of work to make the canvases work with the decentralized network but I don't even see that as the main problem. The main problem maybe is the mode that Canvas is, is sort of offered at the moment, which, which is centralized. So basically it's like a cloud service or a hosted service. So we have, you know, we have servers somewhere uh, that actually run your canvases. You know, when you go into Streamer core application, create a canvas, start, start it, it runs on those centralized boxes. And that's okay uh, and it's pretty cool but it's against the overall goal of creating this decentralized technology and the original uh, idea in the white paper and 2016-2017 era was that in the future these canvases could be run on like decentralized computing nodes that several projects at the time were, were uh, developing and we even um, announced an early partnership with Golem from, from this perspective that eventually the Canvas engine could run on, on the Golem nodes. But it turns out that this work to, to create this decentralized, secure computing environment, it's like, a, it's like a gigantic task and no one has really nailed it in the way that uh, that was envisioned at the early times of these projects. So I'm not really confident that that, that will happen uh, necessarily anytime soon. And I hope I'm wrong, of course. But one realistic way in which canvases could sort of continue their life is also a decentralized way, but, but in a way where everyone runs their own workloads. So you're not, you're not hiring someone's computation to execute the logic of your canvas but rather you're you know running it yourself so instead of running it on our servers you run it on your own own server and your own box and in this way of course it can work there's still the effort needed to uh, make the canvas framework work with the decentralized networks um, and to sort of package it in a way that people can run it themselves but now it would be compatible with the uh, goal and ethos of decentralization so i see that as a sort of in-between uh, solution but in any case it would need to be dropped from the sort of centralized offering that you see today in, in Streamer Core and sort of repackaged. So SIP1 would be about dropping it and then, you know, what happens with it later can be, can be decided. But the proposal here is to, is to sort of give up the, the hosted version. Okay, great. Um, just a couple of very final ones, just to make sure we've covered these earlier questions. Um, yeah. So, uh, which other ways for raising capital are considered by the team? Um, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> there's there's basically two things you can do to and to raise capital, right? You, you can do an equity raise or a token raise. And if you do a token raise, then you're basically doing another ICO. And that leads to the same uh, inflationary effect that so many fear in, in the sort of SIP1 proposal. And the fact is that the project itself does not need more money. So why would we raise more cash, right? So we're building the thing with the ICO funding um, and the purpose of that funding is to build the thing, right? right? And that's, that's going well, that's going okay. Like we're on track, uh, you know, we've, we've delivered uh, stuff, made progress through the roadmaps, we've spent money that is in proportion with, with the progress. So everything's fine on, on that sector. So the project itself doesn't need um, more money from that point of view. Where, where the money is needed is exactly in handing over the sort of 
economy to the broader uh, broader set of people that are involved in streamer so exactly incentivizing nodes and maybe ensuring some kind of um, long-term cash flow to to sponsor like uh, development bounties or stuff like this that um, you know ensure that the project is developing and maintained in the course of of many many years to come so these kind of goals um, can be achieved via via many ways and they they require money but the way that I would do the bootstrapping incentivization is exactly in the way that I propose that the governance processes can decide about these uh, to about minting tokens for that um, and the long-term development goals I think that should be um, <clears throat> that should be achieved either by building some kind of cash flow uh, percentage or cut from from the token economics um, or, or by creating uh, another sort of incentive pool for for developers but but then it becomes but in in well actually in both cases then the, the question is like how do those how does that money get get governed but if we have a governance process that can decide like where to spend the money that's available for development then it all makes sense i think so i think these are these are anyway the options i think the equity raise is not it probably doesn't work because most of like almost all of the value in the project is sort of reflected in the token and not the the, the company is sort of just uh, just a sort of commission company where, where whereas the community of token holders is sort of the, the customer uh, right so <clears throat> The customer should be able to decide at any any given time after the initial project and the funded period like how they want to uh, spend the money that's available in, to the customer okay um and just finally um what about the legal aspect of this um and it would be good to know if it's safe as a future participant of the network uh, sorry, can you repeat? Uh, repeat? I think someone's asking about the legal aspects of this and if there are any complications with regard to potentially minting tokens in the future or these decisions. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> the thing to watch out for in, in crypto is, of course, like um, when you get income, you have to you have to report that. Uh, and if you're earning tokens, then you like by, you know, running a broker node or whatever, then that's pretty important to stay on top of uh, top of those things uh, for sure um, but other than that in this okay in these sort of token uh, economies there there are some you know gray area in the terms like which transactions are for example subject to VAT value-added tax like if there's a if there's a service uh, and a payment let's say there's you know uh, someone wants a service like message transport and then there's someone who provides the service like a set of brokers in uh, in a particular stream then could that be seen like a service offering and is that subject to VAT uh, if it happens within uh, you know if it's not an international one or where where would it be taxed under VAT where is blockchain or or streamer like located geographically these are like really hard questions and you can't really uh, you can't really solve them sometimes these kind of things are worked around exactly by having those burning and minting um, paradigms instead of like a direct direct transfer um, so um, but it doesn't like having these reward programs I don't have any knowledge that they would for example make the token uh, to appear more like a security which is usually the the problem with tokens that they can be considered securities under some circumstances um, so it doesn't 
I don't think there's a reason there. Um, actually having like this decentralization going on makes it less like a security because one of the sort of mm, evaluation points for example in the Howey test that they use in the US is exactly that of decentralization like if if some asset can be seen as an investment into the performance of some uh, team or it's phrased some somehow like you know investment into a common enterprise or something like this uh, then it's more likely to be considered a security whereas if it's sufficiently decentralized in both terms of actual operations i.e. physically operating the thing uh, as well as its governance then it's less likely to be a security so if we can decentralize the network by um, you know having a lot of people operating it as well as decentralize the governance in the way that we are uh, attempting to do now, then uh, it can be argued quite strongly that, uh, that it makes it a lot, lot less like a security from a legal point of view. And that is, all, of course, very good. And the direction that, that we've been sort of trying to drive the project towards um, all the time. Okay, so yeah, I think that's covered most of the questions from, from earlier. There's a couple we can come back to um, if needed, but I think let's open this up now. Um, so a question here from uh, Monis in the governance channel. Um, if this goes through, can the new token support uh, meta transactions and gas like, gasless voting? Uh, yes, so one of the goals, we didn't actually cover this earlier, but uh, of course we want to uh, you know update the token contract also also technically and there's a couple of things that can be can be done there so one of those is exactly adding support of for for meta transactions um, and what, what that can basically do is that somebody else pays for gas for the transaction for example so you basically sign a payload um, and somebody else submits that to the chain and pays gas and this kind of things they are like usability improvements and uh, would be a big, uh, big improvement in, in many cases. Another technical improvement I think that is there to be had is also mentioned in the blog post, which is support for ERC-677, which is like a um, token interface standard for uh, calling like a callback function on a receiving smart contract. So basically when you Currently, uh, and this is the case in most ERC-20 tokens that go back a couple of years, like ours, if, is if you transfer tokens to a smart contract, there's no way to notify that smart contract about it so that it would automatically execute some kind of code uh, upon receiving tokens, right? So the token contract is one contract and the recipient is another one, and there's no connection between these. But what happens in ERC-677 is that this receiving contract can implement like a callback function. And when you transfer tokens to it, then that callback function will be called uh, automatically within that same transaction. And this is very useful for a variety of, of reasons. For example, um, it makes uh, makes it easier to use the token with, with data unions, for example. You can just send tokens to a data union contract and it will do the math uh, of uh, calculating the balances of, of each member of the data union. Uh, it also well, works nicely with, uh, with many newer sort of cross-chain bridge kind of things. So you can just send the tokens to the bridge um, and you know it goes somewhere on the other side of the bridge and can get notified uh, about it and, and these kind of things. So it's just a technical improvement and I think these are maybe the major ones that are there to be had that have appeared in the past you know a couple of years. Um, so get just getting an update, bringing the token contract to the sort of best standards of today is one thing that will be achieved in the migration um, 
proposed in SIP1 in addition to, uh, to raising the, the hard cap. So there's an opportunity to do all these things at the same time and they should be done at the same time because doing the token migration itself is a bit of a pain um, because like you know uh, there's no there's no centralized magic button that that we as the streamer core team can go and press and you know like beep and then everyone has this new token at their at their dis disposal it's rather that you know uh, it's a so it's a self sovereign token so you're going to have to you know take your data tokens and you know go to a migration website or whatever and click a button and then you'll get get the new tokens in exchange for for the old tokens so it will be a like require active action to go through that migration uh, jumping through those those hoops so it's not something that you want to ever do again really so you know can be done once but hopefully not <laughs> hopefully never again after that but of course new token standards come out and and so on and even new new blockchains you know and eventually there's ethereum 2.0 in the horizon nobody knows what exactly that will entail i guess the current ethereum mainnet will be one of the shards on ethereum 2.0 uh, 2.0 so there should be no action or no migration necessary at that time but who knows what it will really look like at the time but this sort of refreshes the token both technically as well as economically for for the foreseeable future uh, for sure um, and from the perspective of the supply even like even more you know it's, it's a bit more than or way more than what will probably be necessary but rather that way than to put the limit too low and then be like restricted by that for the rest of rest of the life of the project so that that's just my take on that super so I'm not seeing any other questions. Um, so if anyone does have anything, you know, please uh, please let us know now. And if you'd like to ask anything directly, just drop your name in the channel, and we can uh, we can unmute you. Um, yeah, and I'll be also hanging out on the governance channel on Discord like every every now and then. I actually really like the the new Discord. I highly encourage everyone to sort of promote that it's much easier to have like uh, discussions on this platform than mm. than on let's say on, on telegram where everything just gets mixed up and maybe you've noticed that the team doesn't go to telegram that much um, i think that's the reason that it's just it's just messy but on discord you have these channels it's really nice you can have good discussion so i'm already finding the benefits from moving to that platform recently and looking forward to the discussions around governance and token economics and all these things that, that can be had mm -hmm. in there so that's that's super and good to see so many people already you know jumping on board that channel yeah for sure for sure it's been great um and yeah thanks for everyone for sending the questions in um, there was one issue maybe we haven't touched on. Um, there was a concern raised that maybe uh, a week's time for this vote wouldn't be enough. Um, and uh, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Just, uh, yeah, whether what you think it's maybe should be longer or just, I guess that's a challenge of decentralized uh, governance in general. Yeah. Maybe there's some other elements around that you, that you think would be worth touching on, maybe from uh, uh, Risto's white paper and research. Yeah. I guess yes and no. I mean, we put the proposal out like a week before the start of the vote, and then the vote is open for five full days, I think. So there's like almost two weeks uh, time to to act and decide about these things. So yeah, 
like it could be extended but then it sort of fades a little bit i think in people's minds like oh yeah there's this vote coming uh, about the proposal that was posted two months ago i don't think that really works to be honest i think it's better to have the vote when the thing is like fresh in people's minds you know they've read the blog post they've had a number of nights to mull over it maybe they joined this ama to to learn more and ask questions and you know now it's active in the brain and if the vote was like one month from now like would you really remember the things that we've discussed today you know so I think it's better to, you know, post a proposal, discuss the proposal, everyone can ask and chat uh, about what's the reasoning behind the proposal, and then, then we vote, and then we move on. Um, that's, that's just my, my take. I think it should be enough. If it's not, please tell us uh, that it's not enough. But I think, like, the flip side of the coin is exactly losing momentum there and i think that would lead lead to lower participation in the vote which we don't want rather engage people sure. for a shorter time period like okay now it's the time to do this and then we do it and then you know people can relax again <laughs> until the next decisions come up okay great um, well, if there's no final questions or uh, yeah nominations to speak, then I think we can I think we can bring this to a close. Um, unless there's anything you want to add, Henry, or you think uh, be useful to just share and as we as we go. Yeah, I mean, I think I've I think I've made all the points that I have to make. I tried to already make them in the blog post. I think some people sort of misread or misunderstood the the proposal, especially SIP1 and the sort of increasing the, the hard cap. So I hope I was able to, you know, clarify on, on those points and emphasize that there is no change to the supply immediately, but rather just enabling that in the future. And personal, like once more, what, what I have to say, like I obviously I can't give any investment advice or, or promise any, any directional change in the price of the token or anything anything like that but personally i believe like it's much more valuable like much much more valuable for the ecosystem to have this kind of tool uh, of of minting tokens uh, compared to the downside that is the uh, that is the like small small to medium uh, inflation that would be introduced by uh, by those programs so I think the community of token holders should definitely like immediately take like a 10% dilution or, or whatever uh, if we could grow the network to hundreds or, or thousands of nodes or whatever. That would be amazing and everyone, everyone should immediately do that in, in my opinion. Uh, but of course neither of these things, neither the dilution or, or, or the growth of the network happens like this by pressing a button you know both are processes that that happen over time but if i could right now like press that button i would <laughs> i would definitely push push that button it's like a no-brainer for me uh, because the things are just on a totally different like scale of magnitude or or, or importance uh, in in my view but of course there's no guarantee um, you could just um, you know, create an incentive program and then nobody shows up to earn those tokens. But I guess there's then also no dilution if, if nobody shows up to earn those tokens. So uh, there's, there's really not that much to lose, uh, but there's potentially a lot to gain in, in getting growth and life into the ecosystem. So I find that to be like extremely exciting. Um, and a great opportunity for for the community and for the project um, yeah so maybe those are my my closing thoughts but 
you guys will have to weigh weigh your own values into the mix. Yeah, I have I have the perspective that that I have on those topics. Great. Well, thank you, thank you very much for everyone for sending their questions, and thank you, Henry. Um, <laughs> I hope this was valuable for everyone. Um, yeah, you know, if there's anything we've missed, let us know. We'll hopefully make this recording available um, tomorrow. Um, uh, I see someone typing, so maybe we have just one uh, question. Ah, just thanks to finish. From okay, Joel. so thank you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, special no thanks to to everyone, and especially those who are sort of challenging the proposals. I think that's exactly the right thing to to do to dig. Like, you need to consider all aspects of the proposal and and then make up your mind. And you know, um, it would be a bit too easy to just take it for granted. Like, okay, this is coming from the streamer team, so it must be good. You know, so it's really good to, uh, you know, look at it from every angle possible and sort of criticize it, try to poke holes in it. And if it still holds water, then, uh, then, it, then it passes and then it happens. And that's exactly the, the process that I'm hoping to create uh, with this governance process. So that's awesome, and thanks everyone for, you know, being active. I think we're seeing more activity in, you know, and and good discussion than than maybe ever before on on the streamer channel. So this was mm. clearly like an uptick in, in people's involvement and interest and so on. So that's super super motivating for me personally and many in the team to to see that kind of engagement great well on that note then i think we'll um i think we'll end it here so yeah thanks once again and um yeah we'll see you in in the community yep thanks everyone from my part thanks bye